Oh, you believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be on all of you. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and I welcome you to this series of programs entitled Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. Today, we will be covering the topic, Ramadan, an introduction. Dr. Zakia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakia, no introduction to such a topic would be complete without you defining the terms. So could you firstly define the term Ramadan? Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam. The word Ramadan is derived from the Arabic word Ramida or Ar Ramad, which means intense scorching heat and dryness. It's also derived from the Arabic word Ramda, which means sun baked sand. In Islamic terminology, the word Ramadan it signifies the intense heat in the stomach due to thirst. When a Muslim fasts, the thirst that is there, it produces heat in the stomach, which is defined as Ramadan. Again, Ramadan, it has another meaning. It means that the good deeds, they scorch the sins and the evil of a Muslim. So Ramadan is a month in which the sins are scorched away by the good deeds, like how a sun scorches the ground in the same way. And heat, normally, it helps in forming, molding, or reshaping virtually every matter. In the same way, Ramadan helps in molding, shaping, and reforming the spiritual and the moral aspects of the human being. That is the reason we term this word as Ramadan. Second, definition of terms, if you like, is saum or fast, as it's sometimes or mostly it's translated in English. Um, could you shed some light on what are the implications of the term fast or saum? Saum is Arabic word, which is singular. Siam is plural. Saum or siam in Arabic is derived from the word sama, which means to abstain or to restrain from the normal things, whether it be eating, drinking, or talking. And a person who observes psalm or abstains from these things is called as a sa'im. And this word is used in the Quran in Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 26. When the angel speaks to Mary, may Allah be pleased with her, who is the mother of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and this word is used. And if you read this word, it says that I have vowed to fast to Allah. But here, the meaning of the word psalm, fast, doesn't mean refraining from eating or drinking. It means refraining from speaking. Because when we go to the context, when we read one verse before in the Quran, Surah Maryam, chapter number 19, verse number 25, it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Mary, may Allah be peace with her, that shake the palm tree towards yourself and the ripe dates will fall. And the next verse, Surah Maryam chapter 19 verse 26 says, eat and drink from them. And then it says that when you meet any human being, tell them, I have vowed to fast for Allah and I will not speak to any human being. So because here it says about speaking, the word psalm used here means that to abstain from speaking. But 
the word Psalm in Islamic terminology, in the Islamic Sharia, it means a person who does an act of worship. And with intention, he does it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he or she abstains from eating, drinking, or nourishment, as well as from sexual intercourse or from lustful semen ejaculation. In short, the word Psalm in Islam means a person who abstains from the fast breakers. And the fast breakers, the things that break the fast, are food, whether taken by mouth or by nose, or drink, any kind of drink, whether it be water, milk, fruit juice, any drink taken from mouth or nose, or any nourishment for the body taken from any source. As well as abstaining from a sexual intercourse. In short, it means abstaining the stomach and the private part. This is what it means Islamically. And this is the basic meaning. But if you go ahead with the broader meaning, it does not mean only abstaining the stomach and the sexual part from the things that break the fast. It even means that along with the fasting of the stomach and the sexual parts, there is fasting of the tongue, of the eyes, of the ears, and the other limbs of the body. That is the reason when we use the word psalm, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 1903, our beloved Prophet said that a person who does not abstain, does not leave false action and false speech, obscenity, etc., Allah does not require of him to abstain from food and drink. That means, beside abstaining from food and drink, you also have to abstain from false speech, false actions, etc. And this message is further repeated by our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, in the Sahih Hadith of Sahih Targib, volume number one, Hadith number 1068, our beloved Prophet said that a person, while fasting, when he abstains from food and drink, he should also abstain from false speech, from obscene language. And if a person gets angry, and if he argues with him, or fights with him, he should say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. So if we look at it, when a person fasts, there are basically three things that he should abstain from. Number one is the stomach and the private parts. They should abstain from things that break the fast, that is food, drink, and sexual act. The second is that the other parts of the body, the tongue, the eyes, the ears, the limbs, even they should fast. Fasting of the tongue means a person should abstain from backbiting, should abstain from slandering, from telling a lie, should abstain from gossiping, abstain from rumor mongering, abstain from vulgarity. Fasting of the eyes means he should abstain from looking at things which are unlawful. Like when he says the Naam he should lower his gaze. He should not watch un-Islamic movies or un-Islamic things. Fasting of the ears means he should abstain from hearing things which are haram, which are prohibited. Like abstain from listening to music, abstain from listening to songs which are un-Islamic. So this is the way how the other parts of the body also fast. And the third thing is the fasting of the heart and the mind. They should abstain from things which take away person from the worship of Allah, from the dhikr of Allah. So this overall is the meaning of the word psalm. Subhanallah, it certainly has a lot more involved in it than I was expecting. Thank you. Dr. Zakir. Are there any other compulsory fasts other than the month of Ramadan that a Muslim must observe? The fasts can be broadly categorized into fard fast, that are obligatory, and the other is the tatau fast, that is the voluntary fast, or the non-obligatory fast, which inshallah will be dealing maybe on the episode 31. 
As far as the obligatory fasts are concerned, you can classify it under four types. The first, as we are discussing, the obligatory fasts during the month of Ramadan. The second is, if a person misses the fast of Ramadan for any reason, cover up the fast miss. It's known as Qada fast. The third is, fasting for expiation of the sins. If you committed a sin and you have to fast, give a kafara. That's the third type. And the fourth is fasting if you have vowed to fast. So these are basically the four types of fard fasting, which are the Islam. Jazakallah khair. Dr. Zakir, another question of great importance regarding the fast in Ramadan. Unfortunately, there are many brothers and sisters who neglect the obligation of fasting during the month of Ramadan. Can you give us some words of advice and indeed from the Quran and the Sunnah, give us some proofs of the fact that it is an obligation upon the Muslim to fast in Ramadan? There are many verses in the Quran as well as many say hadith which very well clarify that it is fard for the Muslims who are supposed to fast, that they should fast, it's a fard. We shall deal with the details for whom it is a fard Inshallah tomorrow. If you read the Quran, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 183, Ya amanu, O you who believe, Qutiba alaykum is sayam, Kama qutiba ala lazina min kablikum, Lalakum tatakun, which means, O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who came before you so that you may learn self restraint we heard the Arabic word used is qutiba. Qutiba means prescribed. It is written. Amongst the other things which are compulsory, it has been prescribed. It has been made compulsory for you, also fasting. As it was made compulsory for people who came before you. That means it was compulsory even for people that came before. The Jews, the Christians, etc. But it's also made compulsory for the Muslims. Ya you are lazina amunu, for the believers. And further it says, point number one is compulsory for you, point number two is compulsory for people who came before you. Point number three, la lakum tattakoon, so that you may learn self-restraint. The Arabic word tattakoon is derived from the word waqa, same as the root word for taqwa, which means that you have to fear yourself, you know, from the wrath of Allah. In short, the meaning of the word taqwa, it is uh, somewhat like God consciousness, piety, it means righteousness. So here Allah is telling, fasting has been prescribed to you so that you may learn self-restraint, so that you learn taqwa, you increase yourself in taqwa, in God consciousness, in righteousness, in piety. And when a person fasts, what happens? That he feels hungry. And normally when a person is well fed, that gives him more energy to many a times do things which are also prohibited and to commit sins. The moment you fast, your action towards things which are prohibited goes down and the barometer of taqwa goes high. That is the reason fasting helps you to improve your self-restraint and increase your taqwa level. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185. Allah says, Shahru Ramzan al-Lazi, unzila fi hil Quran, hudallin nas. That Ramzan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a guidance to humankind. And in it are signs for guidance and judgment between right and wrong. Immediately after that, Allah says, the people who witness this month, they should fast. We again become the fard. For the Muslims, that if you are in this month of Ramadan, you should fast. And it gives exceptions that if you are ill or if you are traveling, then the period can be made later on, etc. etc. But here this verse says, it is compulsory for every Muslim to fast in the month of Ramadan. And the exception is that day. Furthermore, there are several Sahih Ahadith which make it compulsory for the Muslim to fast. I'll just quote one which is the most important one. A beloved Prophet Muhammad he said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Iman, Hadith number eight. Our beloved Prophet said that Islam is based on five pillars. 
The first is, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. The second is establishing prayers. Akram salah. The third is giving zakat. That's obligated charity. The fourth is performing hajj. That's the pilgrimage to the holy city of Makkah. And the fifth is observing psalm. That is fasting. So from this hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Iman, hadith number eight, it says that fasting is one of the pillars of Islam. Not only is it fard, it is one of the principles, one of the pillars of Islam. Amongst the five most important things for a Muslim, one of them is fasting. So from these evidences we come to know that fasting is fard for every Muslim. Well, I don't think it can be put in much of a clearer way, to be honest. And I think that people should take advice and fast this Ramadan. Inshallah. The next question regards the history of fasting actually. Um, was the time period for the observing uh, of a fast and abstaining from the things which break the fast, which you've already mentioned, always the same since the beginning of time or for the Muslims? As far as the Muslims are concerned, when the first time it was mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 183, which I mentioned earlier, that fasting was fard. At that time, the Muslims used to fast three days in a month. Later on, when the verse of the Quran was revealed of Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 185, which I quoted the second time, that Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed, and in it is guidance for the humankind, and in it are signs for guidance and judgment, right and wrong. So the Muslims, when they witness this month, they should fast. So then it became fard for the Muslim to fast the complete month of Ramadan. First it was only three days every month, then it became one full month, only the month of Ramadan. As far as the things that break the fast are concerned, one of the things that break the fast, it is sexual intercourse, even with your wife. So previously, when this verse of Surah Baqarah chapter 2, verse number 185 was revealed, it was not mentioned in detail. So the Muslims at that time, they used to abstain from sexual intercourse, approaching their wives for the full month of Ramadan, even during the day and night. And it was very difficult for many of the Muslims, many of the Sahabas. And that reminds me of a quotation or incidents, which is mentioned in one of the commentaries of the Quran. If you read the commentary of the Quran, the Qurtubi, volume number two, page number 210, it mentions there that Umar bin Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, once after speaking with the Prophet late in the night, he comes back home and he has the urge to sleep with his wife and he spends the time with his wife and he has sexual intercourse with his wife. In the morning when he gets up, he feels very bad, he's ashamed. He immediately goes to the Prophet and he says that I ask pardon from Allah and his messenger for what I have done. And my soul was attracted towards my wife and I had a relationship with my wife in the night. Is there any way that I can be pardoned or is there any way that I can escape? So the Prophet said, is it true that you actually did this? He said, yes, Prophet. The Prophet was shocked. How could Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, could do a thing at that time it was prohibited? He said, yes, Allah Messenger, I did it. Is there any way I can be pardoned? So the Prophet said, no one besides Allah can give the command. And Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, immediately after this, the verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 187 was revealed. It says that permitted to you during the nights of the fast is approaching your wives. And then it says, Hunna libasu lakum wa antum libasu lahunna. That they are your garments and you are their garments. That means your wives are your garments and you are the garments of your wife. And Allah says that we know what you do secretly in the night. But Allah forgave you. And from now onwards, 
you can approach your wives during the nights of the fast and you can eat and drink till the white thread of dawn is differentiated from the black thread. So when this verse was revealed later on, Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse number 87, then the rules were a bit more relaxed. That they could have sexual relationship with their wife during the nights, but during the day they have to abstain. Furthermore, as far as eating was concerned, previously, before Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse number 187 was revealed, the Muslims could eat and drink after the sun sets. But the moment they sleep, after that they can't eat. Then they can eat only the next day after sunsets. So there's an incident with one of the Sahabas, Kais, may Allah be pleased with him. He worked very hard and he was fasting. And when it was time to break the fast, he comes home and he tells his wife that I want to have some food. So the wife says that there's no food in the house, I'll just get it from outside. And she goes out to get food. Now because he was tired working the full day, by the time the wife comes back, he goes to sleep. When the wife comes back to the house, she sees the husband has gone to sleep. So now she says, finish. Once he's gone to sleep, he can't eat. So that night, he could not eat. The next day, he had to fast. And by evening the next day, he faints. And the people go to the Prophet, that this is what happened. Because once you sleep, you can't eat. Later on, this verse was which I said earlier. Surah Bakra chapter 2, verse number 87, which says, besides approaching your wives at night, you can eat and drink till the white thread of dawn is differentiated from the black thread. So then the rules that we follow today, that fasting means that you have to abstain from food and drink and nourishment, as well as from sexual intercourse, right from dawn unto sunset. And having the intention that we have to be the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an act of worship. So this is the history, how we finally got this. It's very interesting and uh, I think we've got it easy as compared to uh, Sahaba, alhamdulillah. Previously, as according to what you've already said regarding the history of fasting, uh, Muslims were commanded to fast for three days and then one month. Is this an indication of a contradiction in the Quran? Actually, there's no contradiction in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 2, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرَانَ وَلَوْ قَانَا مِنِ دِّقَرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجُدُ فِي اِقْتِلَافٍ كَسِيرًا Do they not consider the Quran with care? Do they not ponder over the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many contradictions. So, no two verses of the Quran will ever contradict. But there's something like abrogation, which people differ. According to me, abrogation doesn't mean contradiction. Abrogation means the verses that were revealed later, as Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 106. We do not cause any of the verse or ayats of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be forgotten, but we replace it with something similar or better. So, many a times, when things that were prohibited, or things that were made compulsory, they came in stages. Not that it was difficult or made easy. Sometimes things difficult were made easy. Sometimes things initially were made easy, so people get used to it and then difficult. For example, regarding prohibition of alcohol. The first verse to be revealed was Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 219, which says that in alcohol, in intoxicants, is profit and loss. Loss is more than profit. It didn't say it was haram. Only gave a guidance that loss is more than profit. Then Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 43, says that when you're intoxicated, don't offer salah. It didn't say that if you're not offering salah, you can have intoxicants. If that's what was mentioned, then there's a problem. It only said, do not be intoxicated while offering salah. And since the Muslims have to offer five times salah, that means having alcohol, intoxicants in the morning without other question. Maybe in the evening, if you had, by the time you get up in the morning, you become sober. The final prohibition came in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 90. Ya ayyu al amunu. Oh, you believe. Innam al khamru al maisuru. Most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Well, Ansabu al aslamu. Dedication of stones, divination of arrows. Rishthum min amali shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. Fashtanibu lallakum tuflihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. So here we come to know that the ban, the prohibition on having intoxicants, alcohol, came in stages. 
it was easy first, only gave a guidance that it's more evil than good. Then while praying, don't have intoxicant, then final ban came. So similarly for fasting, no two verses of the Quran contradict. Though there are some people who say, oh, no, the Quran, now that verse did not be followed. I disagree with that. Abrogation doesn't mean so contradiction. Abrogation means the last verse of Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 90, includes the first two verses. If it's banned, overall, it's even banned while offering salah. So same way here, if you read Surah Bakra, chapter 283, when it was said fasting is compulsory, it did not specify the time three days. That we get from other sources. The Quran doesn't specify. It only says fasting is fard. Then it says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 285, that you have to fast for the full month of Ramadan. So, what was mentioned about three days every month, fasting, was actually from other sources. If it was mentioned in the Quran, that you have to fast for three days, and then it says after that fast for full month, then there's a contradiction. Furthermore, previously, it was said, again, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 184, that you have to fast, but those who cannot fast, or those who can fast with difficulties, they have two options. Either fast, or feed a person who's poor, who's indigent. So that time, it was not fard. If it's difficult for you to fast, yet you can fast, or you can feed a poor person, but fasting is better, but not fard. Now this was for general, but afterwards when the verse of Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 85 was revealed, then it became first for everyone. Now this verse refers to those people who are ill, terminally ill, or they're very elderly people. That means mentally they are fine, but physically they cannot fast in their life. So if you're ill, terminally ill means ill for a long period and your health may not get fine. Or if you're so elderly which you cannot fast and every year you'll keep on getting more and more old. So here it says, if you can fast with difficulty, fine. Otherwise, feed someone indigent, a poor person. Similarly, as far as having sexual intercourse, previously the rule was, you should not have sexual intercourse in the full month of Ramadan, whether day or night. But this is not mentioned in the Quran. The Quran only says fast in the month of Ramadan. This we get from the other sources. The Quran is not contradicting. It is actually first fasting three days was in fact easier. Then fast, if it's difficult, if you don't want to fast, don't fast. Feed a poor person. So it was easier initially. Then later on it became difficult. As far as the approaching your wife, initially it was difficult. That you cannot approach the full month. And then Allah made it easy. So no two verses of the Quran contradict. But because the Quran was revealed in a span of 22 and a half years, so many things that were prohibited came one shot immediately or it came in stages. Many things which were fard came immediately or came in stages. So fasting, because initially it was difficult for the people, it came in stages. But Alhamdulillah, with all these things, no two verses of the Quran ever contradict Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. It seems as though this is an indication of Allah's mercy that He's given mankind Alhamdulillah. so many opportunities to implement His uh, wonderful way. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Now, the next question of great importance again is, um, when it comes to the fast, is it simply the doing away of food, drink and sexual relations or other implications? The things which are fard for a person who fasts, as you mentioned earlier, one of them is to abstain from things that break the fast. That is food, drink, and having sexual relationship. But besides this, one another important factor is, is the intention, is the niyyah. Any deed without the niyyah, for the akhra, it is useless. The niyyah should be there. The niyyah, the intention is very important. Because we intend to fast to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's act of worship. If the intention is not there, then there are various different types of fast. For example, a person may fast for political reason. A person may fast as a passive resistance. A person may fast as a hunger strike. I'm starving, I'm hunger strike, to get whatever he wants. You know, there are people fasting, non-Muslim fasting. A person may fast for health reason, maybe for dieting. He may fast maybe to lose weight. 
He may fast, it may be a medical treatment. But all these fasts, they do not have intention, the niyyah, to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the reason in the Islamic Sharia, when we abstain from things that break the fast, it should be accompanied by the niyyah. Without the niyyah, the fast is useless. It's very important. Niyyah is compulsory for every act of worship, including fasting. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 2, in the Book of Zakat, chapter number 370, hadith number 2198. Our beloved Prophet said that when you have intention to approach your wife, to have a relationship with your wife, the moment you have intention, even that becomes charity. The Sahaba asked, having relationship with your wife is also charity. How come, O oh beloved Prophet? The Prophet said that if you have sexual relationship with people who are not your wives, if it's unlawful, isn't it a sin? They said, Ya Rasulullah, yes, it is a sin. So that is, if you have sexual relationship with the person you're supposed to have, that is your wife, with the niya, that's an act of charity. That means niya is very important. The moment you have niya, then you get up for that. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Bayyana, chapter number 98, verse number 5, it's mentioned, and he commanded that you worship him alone and in sincere devotion, true in faith. Here the word used is liabudu, which means to worship. But actually, abudu, it means to humble. But the word liabudu in Arabic is normally used for worship. It actually means to humble. The other Arabic word used is muklisun, which means to serve with piety and with dedication. So here we should serve only for Allah. And a worship should be to Him alone. That should be a niyyah. That is the main intention. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 29, that we have created for you everything on this earth. When Allah has created everything in this earth for us, not one-tenth, not one-fifth, not one-fourth, not half, but everything for the human beings in this earth, so, but natural, our servitude should only be to him and no one else. If, while worshipping him, we worship somebody else, then it is useless. We have to only worship him and no one else. We can't say that I am praying two rakat for Allah and two rakat for somebody else. We can't say that I am sacrificing one goat for Allah and the second goat for a king or a ruler. All our worship should be to him alone and no one else. And that reminds me of Hadith. The first hadith in Sahih Bukhari, where Umar may Allah be pleased with him, he says that the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Innam al amala bin niya. Your deeds are based on your intention. Your actions are judged by intention. And anyone who has migrated with the intention for the line of the Rasul, he has migrated for the line of the Rasul. But if someone has migrated for the wealth in this world or for marriage, he has migrated for the wealth and marriage. The intention is important. Why did you do it? Why did you migrate? Why did you jihad? So intention is very important for any act of worship, including psalm that is fasting. Thank you very much. Furthermore, regarding the intention, still on the intentions issue, does one always have to make intentions regarding when you're about to fast? And secondly, the timing of the intentions. Can you just say something a little bit about that? I far the intention is concerned, as I mentioned earlier, that intention is a fard. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sunan Nisai, Book of Fasting, Hadith number 2331, our beloved Prophet said, a person fast not accepted if he does not make intention in the previous night. That means for all the fard fasting, compulsory fasting, making intention the previous night is compulsory. It can be any part of the previous night. It can even be till as late as just before the Fajr time. Any time of the night you can make intention. A person can make intention in the beginning of Ramadan and it can be valid for the full month of Ramadan. Unless he breaks it if he's sick or if he's traveling, then he has to again make intention. But one intention is also sufficient. And many people think they have a misconception that verbally saying it aloud is a must, which is not a requirement. I don't have to say verbally that I intend to fast. 
because my intention is a niya from the heart. For example, if I get up late in the night, much before fajr time, or fasting, suppose my son, when we have got up to do a suhur late in the night, and my son asks me that, why have you got up? I will tell him, because we have to fast. It's already understood. The niya is there. I don't have to say that I have got up to fast. Mm -hmm. The niya is there. So niya is important, niya is in the heart. You don't have to say it with your tongue. That's what most of the people think. And I don't know of any hadith which says that the Prophet or the Sahaba ever said loudly that I intend to fast. Intention is in the heart. And one intention is sufficient for the fullness of Ramadan, unless, as I said, it's broken. But this is only for the fard fast. For a voluntary fast, fast which is not a fard fast, intention is not a fard because there's a hadith again mentioned in Sunan Nisai in the book of fasting, hadith number 2323. One is the Prophet, he tells his wife that I want food to eat. And the wife said that there's no food to eat. So he said, okay, I'm fasting. That means his intention was not there before in the previous night. He made it on the spot. He abstained from before dawn, but his intention was afterwards in the morning. So for the voluntary fast, it's not compulsive to be made early the previous night, except if it's a very important voluntary fast like the Ashura, the 10th of Muharram, Ashura, or it can be the day of Arafat. It's preferable to make intention before because that's a very important fast. For all the other voluntary fast, it's not compulsory to be made before previous night. For the Niya, there are other three things which are very important. One thing, if it's by force, and if something is broken, then it can be forgiven, or by error, or by forgetfulness. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 106, that after a person has believed, then if he does something of unbelief, does something of kufr, except by force. That means if he does by force, even kufr or shirk, Allah will forgive. So if someone forces a person to break the fast, his niya was in there, he can be forgiven. And Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 286, that, O oh Lord, please do not catch us. Please do not hold us responsible. When we err, when we make a mistake, or when we forget. So if a person in his forgetfulness breaks his fast like has water, Allah will forgive him. Or if because of a mistake, Allah will forgive him, which we shall deal later, inshallah. SubhanAllah. There's a lot of very important information there regarding intention, which I'm sure is going to be massive benefit to everyone who's listening and watching, indeed. Another thing which has been bothering me for some time is the fact that fasting is one of the pillars of Islam, correct? Now, but is there anything which uh, differentiates the act of worship, fasting, the pillar, from the other four pillars, perhaps? As I mentioned earlier that there are five pillars of Islam, and all of them are important, but the differentiation between psalm, fasting, as compared to other pillars is that the other pillars of Islam, whether it be Salah, whether it be Zakat, whether it be Hajj, it can be done by a person to show to the others, for yeah, to be seen or to be heard. You know, maybe I want to show myself, you know, I'm a very pious person, so I'm offering Salah to show to the people. You know, I'm going for Hajj to make a show of it. Can be possible. Can be possible to give charity so that people will say I'm a charitable person, for sure. But fasting cannot be done for yeah. Cannot be done to show other people why. A person can easily fast and when no one is watching, he can have food, he can have drink. If a person who truly fasts and abstains from things that break the fast, he's doing it only for Allah and no one else. So that is the difference between psalm and the other pillars of Islam. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1904. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Allah says that all the deeds done by the sons of Adam, they are for themselves only. He does it for himself. But fasting is for me. And I will reward him. 
And fasting is a shield. A person fasting, he abstains from obscene things. He abstains from lying and abstains from yelling. And if a person gets angry at him and abuses him, he says, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. And then the hadith further goes on, and Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that I swear by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, in whose hand is the soul of Muhammad, that the breath of a person who fasts is sweeter to Allah than the scent of musk. And a person who fasts, he feels happy twice. Once while breaking the fast, and once when he meets his creator, his Lord. So in this hadith, there are various aspects mentioned. First is that fasting is only done for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one else. It's not for Yah. Secondly, fasting is a shield. It's a protection. It keeps you away from wrong things, from obscenity, from vulgarity. And if someone is angry, it says that you have to calm him down, say, I'm fasting, I'm fasting. Because in the hadith where Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, hadith number 2038, that the Satan runs in the circulatory system of the human being like the blood. So when we fast, we feel hungry. When we're hungry, you know, the energy level goes down and the things which required for doing things away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so taqwa level goes up. Because when we eat food, it goes into the blood. When we restrict food, the restriction of the pathway of the Satan is there. So that is the reason when we fast, our taqwa level increases. Dr. Zakir, Ramadan is truly a wonderful month and I've felt it, always felt myself that um, brothers and sisters come together and there seems to be a wonderful bond in that month between us all. Is there any special message about Ramadan and brotherhood? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that the Muslim is one body. All the Muslims, they are one body. And if we analyze and if we look around, all the Muslims, we are different. We are diversified as far as language is concerned, as far as color is concerned, as far as the race is concerned, as far as the country where we come from, we are diversified, different. But we are united under one statement, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Messenger of Allah. So based only on this kalma, the Muslims throughout the world are united. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, Ya ayyuhan nasu, inna khalaqnaakum min zakrin wa unsa wa ja'alnaakum, shu'ubam wa qaba ila li ta'arafu. Inna kramakum inda Allah yatkaakum, inna Allah alimun kabir. Which means, O oh, humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and have divided you into nations and tribes so that you shall recognize each other, not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa. The criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not caste, is not color, is not race, is not sex, is not wealth. It is taqwa. It is God consciousness. It is piety. And this month of Ramadan, Allah says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 183, so that you may learn self-restraint, so that your taqwa may increase. So more your taqwa increases, all the Muslims in the world, they are united. Because we are like one brotherhood. Caste, color, creed cannot differentiate us. We are one. And in the month of Ramadan, taqwa increases and the brotherhood increases. And the best example of brotherhood was even at the time of the Prophet. The Sahabas came from different countries, different colors, different races. We have the example of Abu Bakr. May Allah be pleased with him. He was a Quraysh. We have the example of Bilal. May Allah be pleased with him. He was from Ethiopia. He was a Ethiopian. We have the example of Shweb. May Allah be pleased with him. He was Roman. We have the example of Salman Farsi. May Allah be pleased with him. He was from Persia. So we have from different, different countries, different, different days, different, different colors. And if we go down the line of the history of Islam further, we have the same thing. We have Imam Bukhari. He was a great scholar. He was from Bukhara. He was not an Arab. We have Muhammad the Conqueror. He was from Turkey. He was a Turk. We have the example of Salman Ayyubi. 
He was a Kurd. Then we have the example of Allama Iqbal. He was from India. So what we know that we have Muslims from different parts of the world. And this brotherhood, we learn more in the month of Ramadan because our taqwa level increases in Ramadan. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, this hadith of Bukhari, volume number one, hadith number 468, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that one faithful believer, one Muslim to another Muslim is like a brick of a wall and he collapsed his hand like that. And the beloved Prophet also said, it's hadith of Sahih Muslim, volume number four, hadith number 6219, that the beloved Prophet said, one Muslim should never oppress the other Muslim. He should not fail him. He should not lie to him. He should always be truthful. And one Muslim cannot go against another Muslim. So that is the brotherhood which a beloved Prophet taught us. And the best we learn is in this month of Ramadan. Jazakallah uh, khair, Dr. Zakir Naik, for this uh, enthralling and very, very interesting uh, set of answers you've given us today on an introduction to Ramadan. Brothers and sisters, I hope that you have derived as much benefit as I have myself uh, from the answers that Dr. Zakir Naik has given us. Jazakallah khair for Dr. Zakir Naik giving those answers. Alhamdulillah. To brothers and sisters, join us again the same time tomorrow when we will be discussing when is fasting obligatory and exempted. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs>